Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, for those of you who don't know, don't know me, I'm Joe Massaro, the, the president and CEO of PRLA, uh, and we appreciate your attendance today. Um, our volunteer leaders, our members, um, those who are part of the Inspire Brands group, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, we're, we're happy to put this report together for you and, and share the, the election results. Um, obviously, the, the national elections took a lot of attention, uh, took a lot of the air out of the room, if you will, leading up to and then uh, right after the election. But as you all know, oftentimes it's the state and local elections that impact our businesses most directly. And so uh, our team wanted to, to take a moment to share with you those results and talk a little bit about some of the policy positions and, and initiatives that we think will come about leading into the next session. Uh, would like to say thank you to all of our volunteers for your guidance, uh, for your engagement. There were quite a few wins this past year, um, quite a few things that were not made that that were made a little less terrible, if you will, uh, and some things that we wanted to advance, but politics just prevented us from getting to get across the finish line. But we have an opportunity to um, leading into next year. And also want to thank our, our professional GA team, both in-house and contract lobby professionals who have helped uh, with a, a very successful uh, government affairs year. So with that, I'll turn it right over to Zach Pizik, who will start us off with the programming. Zach? Good morning, everyone, and uh, happy webinar Friday here. It uh, doesn't have the same ring to it as our typical webinar Wednesday, but I, I feel like it works. Thank you, Joe, very much for the kind words and for the welcome and the introduction. I am, I guess, as it relates to this call, I am the real Zach Pizik standing up, PRLA's uh, Senior Director of Public Affairs here. Uh, my colleague, Lauren Brinjak, PRLA's Senior Director of Legislative Affairs, is also with us today, just returning from a work conference out in Las Vegas. I am uh, very glad that Lauren was able to join us. Thank you, Lauren. I can't imagine that jet lag. We're also joined by Clint Cullison and Madison Stromswald, uh, PRLA's partners at Greenleaf Partners. So we had an election. Uh, the dust has started to settle. Uh, where did things land in the Pennsylvania House? How about the Pennsylvania State Senate? Uh, we plan on discussing all of that with you today. Uh, and furthermore, how will that impact restaurants, hospitality, and the broader tourism industries here in the Commonwealth? And you might be asking, well, why did we wait until November 15th for this important update? Well, just earlier this week, the Pennsylvania House and Senate uh, returned for leadership elections. In other words, each caucus and each chamber decided who it is that will lead efforts with assigning committee chairs, establishing an agenda, uh, choosing who gets the bigger office with the better views, etc. Uh, and I'm really not kidding about the bigger office thing, but we thought it was important to be prepared to discuss all that with you, uh, as well as general election results. Uh, so we plan on going top to bottom, covering federal, state, and leadership election results here in uh, uh, the State General Assembly, along with our friends from uh, Greenlee. And then towards the end, we're going to save plenty of time for Q&A. So feel free to, if you have questions along the way, feel free to drop those in the chat, and we'll try our best to get to all of those uh, at the end of the program. Here, So I'm going to kick things off uh, with our first slide, the White House. Uh, and uh, uh, in fact, before we even go there, I do want to briefly discuss Election Day spending. Uh, and I'm, I'm sorry, I imagine the anticipation as to who won that race for president is killing you. And I'll get there in a moment. But I do think to put all this into perspective, it's important to talk about uh, campaign spending. Uh, I'm sure I'm not the only one who does not miss the countless negative attack ads flying across the TV channels and, and flooding social media. Uh, as it relates to Election Day spending, there were just over 20 competitive legislative races in the PA legislature. Uh, those that both sides seem to agree in some form or another were flippable, flippable districts or flippable seats. Uh, obviously, all of that is paired with a, a very, very important slate of federal races. Uh, according to Spotlight PA, uh, spending in those flippable districts between May 14th and October 21st, uh, the average House or Senate race was $1.1 million and $3.5 million, uh, respectively. Uh, spending in the top three races surpassed $4 million. Uh, once accounting for independent expenditures, which is difficult to do, uh, the actual price tag is probably 
significantly higher. Uh, if you look at the Frank Burns seat, for instance, which we'll talk more about later, uh, that seat, uh, that's the seat that ended up dramatically deciding which party maintained control of the Pennsylvania House. $4 million in that race alone total from start to finish, again, not counting independent expenditures. Uh, as it relates to the presidential election, uh, and this slide here, more than $20 billion had floated into that race, depending on what source you go with. And as I'm sure everyone knows, Donald Trump has been elected uh, the 47th president of the United States. Uh, Trump returns to the White House as just the second president to ever be reelected to office after having been out of office or out of the White House for four years. Uh, Trump brings with him a slate of policy positions, new policy positions and priorities that, as you might imagine, are quite different than those of the Biden administration. So along with our national partners here at PRLA, uh, there are a variety of policy items uh, that we're going to be tracking and monitoring once Trump is sworn in this coming January. Uh, just this week, he started announcing various nominations for top cabinet positions. Uh, I'm sure many of you have seen those on the news, so many of which we are monitoring here and how they might impact the industries we represent. Uh, as of now, uh, there are more questions than there are answers, admittedly. Uh, what will happen to the new overtime threshold? Uh, how aggressive will uh, President Trump push his idea of no taxes on tips? Tariffs, tariffs, tariffs. How will they impact the industry? Uh, PRLA has already been in touch uh, with groups, uh, groups regarding tariffs, such as wine tariffs, uh, that have surfaced uh, during uh, Trump's first term. Uh, rail and rail funding for our friends in northeastern uh, Pennsylvania who have asked about the Amtrak project. How might that funding be impacted uh, by a Trump administration? So uh, furthermore, uh, will Trump decide to tap anyone in Pennsylvania government to join his administration? And if so, would that impact the dynamic or the PA political landscape? So like I noted, more questions than answers, but these are some of the questions that are bubbling to the surface right now. I know a few of you have already messaged me about the policy, no taxes on tips. So uh, again, these are things we're monitoring. Uh, what we do know is that Donald Trump will be president and he's going to be sworn in on January 20th, 2025, which is a Monday. Uh, will it be the largest crowd ever? Uh, just kidding. For those who remember that drama back in 2017, I guess we'll see. Uh, but we do know it's happening and we'll continue to keep you posted uh, on, on all our various communication channels, especially the PRLA daily update on those issues as they come up. So with that, I want to turn it over to our, our friends at Greenlee uh, to discuss the U.S. Senate races and the U.S. House races. Thanks, Zach. Well, as you're all aware, uh, we had the entire U.S. House up for re-election in this uh, election cycle, and several states had uh, one senator up for re-election as well. In Pennsylvania, there was one U.S. Senate seat that was open for election this cycle, and there was uh, Bob Casey versus Dave McCormick. Again, I'm sure many of you know this, but Bob Casey is a longtime U.S. Senator He's also the son of former PA Governor Casey. And so uh, it was very uh, surprising to many to see him unseated by uh, a Dave McCormick. Uh, Dave McCormick worked for President George W. Bush. He is also the president and CEO of Bridgewater Associates, and he's a West Point graduate. Now, AP has called this race in favor of Dave McCormick, but if you've been paying close attention to the news lately, you'll see that uh, there's been an automatic recount that has, uh, that's has that been triggered. So in Pennsylvania, if there is a margin of 0.5% difference between the, uh, the candidates' total votes uh, or less, a recount is triggered. So as of earlier this week, uh, McCormick was only leading by about 0.4 percent, uh, and counties must complete their current count before uh, starting the recount, which can start no later than next Wednesday, November 20th, and then the recount must be completed by Tuesday, November 26th, and results must be reported by the Secretary of State by uh, Wednesday, November 27th. So we hope to uh, have some sort of finality uh, here in the in the coming days or the coming week uh, on really what this race uh, will settle as. But uh, you know we have to let the counties do their their work and and start that recount. Uh, so that one is even though it's been called for Dave McCormick, I would say it's a light TBD. 
But, uh, you know, in the U.S. House, we, we did have uh, a handful of races that were flipped by the GOP. In fact, three seats flipped in favor of the GOP here in Pennsylvania. Um, um, and, oh, excuse me, that's a, for the Senate. There were three uh, GOP seats that were, were flipped in the U.S. Senate, um, Ohio, Montana, West Virginia. And so the reason I raise that is because if they're able to flip this uh, Dave McCormick seat, that gives them one more as well. So all 17 congressional races in Pennsylvania were on the ballot. Uh, we want to really bring close attention to uh, the Ryan McKenzie seat, which is noted here. Uh, this was held by Susan Wild, a, a longtime incumbent here in the, the 7th Congressional District. Uh, that is Lehigh Valley area. Uh, Ryan McKenzie is actually a, a decent ally to PRLA and has been uh, an ally during his time served in the State House here in Pennsylvania. And that district encompasses Carbon, Lehigh, Northampton counties, as well as part of Monroe. Uh, but then, of course, we want to bring attention to uh, some others as well. Uh, the, the Matt Cartwright uh, race is, is of note uh, because that was also flipped. Uh, that is now going to be represented by uh, Rob uh, Breshinen Jr. Uh, and that is uh, encompassing Wayne, Pike, and Lackawanna counties uh, with parts of Luzerne and, and Monroe. And of course, uh, you know, a shout out to uh, Brian Fitzpatrick in uh, Northeast Pennsylvania as well, a, a great supporter of, of PRLA. So uh, some of these were expected. Uh, some of them were going to be tight, and, and we knew that, uh, especially, of course, the Matt Cartwright seat and, and the Susan Wild seat, which uh, ultimately were flipped. So this means that Pennsylvania has 10 U.S. Uh, House members who are Republicans and seven who are Democrats, uh, making a total of 17. Um, there are still a handful of outstanding races that we've seen nationwide to determine the final makeup of the U.S. House, but it seems Republicans have secured the majority at the end of the day. Uh, they needed that magic number of, of 218. Thank you, Madison. Appreciate that update. And then I think we've got some, uh, we're moving on to some state updates here. Next slide, I believe, is state row offices. So uh, I'll, I'll introduce Clint Collison from Greenlee. Clint. I think it's still good morning, everybody. Yep, 15 more minutes. 15 minutes. To, uh, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you guys for having me on the call today. Uh, appreciate working with you guys and the, the PRLA team over here. Thank you, uh, Joe and others, for the kind words earlier on here. Um, the the row offices um, were a clean sweep by the Republican slate. Um, the three offices that are up every four year, the same years that we have presidential elections, uh, attorney general, auditor general, and treasurer, uh, all three races uh, were contested. Uh, and one of them in particular, uh, we'll start with the attorney general, uh, was actually an open seat. Um, as you guys may recall, uh, Governor Shapiro was our former uh, attorney general, the last attorney general that ran for election, rather. Um, and when he became governor, he had stepped down from that role. Uh, and then his governor got to nominate his successor, uh, Michelle Henry, who was subsequently confirmed by the Senate. She is the current attorney general. Uh, as part of her deal to get confirmed by the Senate, she had agreed to not run for the post uh, because usually, uh, with some exceptions, uh, incumbents running uh, for an office uh, have a little bit better name ID uh, and get a leg up in the election. And since uh, the, the office was being vacated, um, the Republican-controlled Senate wanted someone that wasn't going to necessarily run again for that term. Uh, two candidates in the race, um, Democratic candidate Eugene D. Pasquale, uh, former Auditor General for the Commonwealth, uh, was in that office for two terms. Uh, previous to that, he was a State House member. Uh, previous to that, he worked over at DEP in the administration for a number of years. Uh, and then the Republican challenger, uh, Dave Sunday, a prosecutor from York County, uh, current DA of York County, uh, and Dave Sunday um, was was won that uh, won that race as the Republican, uh, and will become our next Attorney General in January when they are sworn in. Uh, Auditor General, um, incumbent race, um, so Tim DeFore, Republican candidate, uh, had won that office four years ago and has been serving our Commonwealth as the Auditor General to date. Um, these offices, I should note, uh, all three of them actually are term limited offices. Uh, so candidates can only win uh, or only uh, hold those seats for two consecutive terms. Uh, they're four year terms. So this is um, the beginning of Tim DeFore's second uh, consecutive term, as say, say holds true for the treasurer. Um, Tim was challenged by Malcolm Kenyatta out of Philadelphia. 
Um, Malcolm is a sitting state house member uh, in, in the Pennsylvania State House. Uh, he ran concurrently for both his house seat and for uh, the post of Auditor General. Uh, and Tim, uh, the incumbent Republican, easily won that role. Um, Treasurer um, of Pennsylvania, uh, again, another incumbent, Stacey Garrity, uh, who has been in this role for, for four years, uh, ran and handily won um, the race against her challenger, Aaron McClelland. Um, a Democrat from Allegheny County. Um, interesting note for this race, Aaron McClellan won the primary pretty handily uh, against Ryan Bizarro, who was a sitting state house member from up in Erie. Uh, once Aaron cleared the primary, um, the party machine um, and Governor Shapiro specifically kind of abandoned her, uh, not kind of, they abandoned her. Um, she was the only statewide row office uh, candidate to not get the endorsement of Governor Shapiro. Um, it's interesting, you know, we, we talked about the, the presidential election uh, and the, the U.S. Senate race, which are, you know, the kind of the top tier everyone was watching races. Um, and, and those races, particularly the uh, the Casey or the, uh, yeah, the Casey and uh, McCormick race, you know, decided maybe by 30,000 votes, give or take, um, you know, even at the top of the ticket, uh, President elect Trump, uh, former president and now president elect. I'm not really sure what the correct title is at this point. Uh, for, for, for Trump uh, beating uh, Lieutenant or uh, yeah, Lieutenant President, let's try Vice President uh, Kamala Harris, uh, beating her by almost 100,000 votes. Um, what was interesting uh, in this election is you get down to the, the three races that we're talking about right now at the row offices, Attorney General, Auditor General, and State Treasurer. Um, those races were decided by much larger uh, margins. Uh, like I said, only about 100,000 votes separating Donald Trump from Kamala Harris. Um, and only 30,000 some votes separating Bob Casey and Dave McCormick. Uh, when you get down to the Auditor General and Attorney General races, those two races were decided in favor of the Republican candidates uh, by roughly 300,000 votes. Um, so almost 200,000 more votes than Donald Trump got. Uh, and then you jump down to the PA Treasurer uh, and Stacey Garrity, that race, that margin of victory for um, Treasurer Garrity uh, is almost half a million votes. Um, so almost 400,000 votes more in Pennsylvania cast for the state treasurer than for the president of the United States uh, in favor of the Republican candidate. Um, so you really you saw some of the national politics, uh, which, as, as Zach correctly noted, um, dominating the airwaves. Uh, it was difficult for these three row offices to break through all the noise. Um, they simply don't have the interest uh, and the, the capital that the larger races have. Um, I think the, the numbers I saw between the U.S. Senate race and the presidential race in Pennsylvania alone were close to a billion dollars. And I know Zach mentioned it. It's close to $20 billion nationwide. Uh, imagine, you know, a billion of that is spent just here in, in, in PA, uh, which tells you how important our Commonwealth is uh, to, to what's going on in the national level. Uh, and it's a good sign that we had so many folks come out and vote. Obviously, uh, we could have had a lot more folks uh, come out and vote. Only roughly three and a half million people out of 13 million Pennsylvanians. Obviously, not all of them eligible to vote, but uh, many, many more than, than what showed up uh, to vote uh, could have come out and, and did not. Um, the state treasurer's office is responsible for managing um, $150 billion plus uh, of state uh, assets. And so that's a pretty important role. Uh, I would suspect, a little foreshadowing here perhaps, uh, given um, Treasurer Garrity's uh, margin of victory and the fact that she's got more votes now uh, for a statewide row office than anyone in recent history to include uh, Shapiro running for governor, um, I suspect that we will see her name again uh, in maybe not four years, maybe two years. Um, you know, we, we've got uh, two years from now will be the gubernatorial election. It will be presumably Governor Shapiro and whomever the Republican candidate is. Um, it could also be potentially a, um, a U.S. Senate race. Um, so interesting to see. I think uh, her, her political future is bright ahead uh, with her popularity and name ID right now. Um, I suspect that we'll see her again, uh, either as a gubernatorial candidate uh, or as a U.S. Senate candidate in the near future. Next slide, please. You guys get stuck with me for another section here uh, in the Pennsylvania Senate. Um, Pennsylvania Senate was maybe, with the exception of the House, one of the more boring races to watch. Uh, the PA House was you know, probably the most boring uh, thing going on uh, in, the, in the state, except for maybe the Burns race. Uh, in Pennsylvania, we elect half of our Senate every two years. 
Um, those with odd numbered districts were up this session or uh, this year, excuse me. Uh, so of the 50 uh, member Senate, 25 races um, were conducted. Um, eight of those races were uncontested. Um, there were, uh, with two exceptions, no flips of party control. Um, the exceptions of that being here in Dolphin County, uh, incumbent uh, John DeSanto was retiring. And so there was a, a contested um, general election between State House member Patty Kim, a Democrat from the city of Harrisburg, and Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania Dolphin County's treasurer, uh, Nick DeFrancesco, uh, who had just come off of uh, winning a, a countywide election for treasurer. Um, he was formerly the Dolph a Dolphin County commissioner as well before he went into private practice for a little while or on the private side of things for a little while. Uh, but his, his entree back into politics uh, when he won, won and ran for county treasurer. Um, that race was um, over before it started in some respects. Um, you know, Nick got into the race late because of the um, timing of the decision by uh, Senator DeSanto. Uh, Patty Kim was geared up and running for that seat, whether or not John was getting out of the race. Uh, but the Republicans, out of deference for the incumbent, weren't making any moves until there was an announcement. And um, John really didn't pull out of the race until December. And uh, for a race for a district rather um, that comprises almost 260,000 people, give or take in a, a Pennsylvania house district. Um, you really have to get out there early uh, before the primary even starts to start getting your name ID out to meet with voters, to talk to folks and, and create coalitions. Um, let me take a step back and I, I should have noted, but I forgot to, um, the PA Senate races that were run this time were all being done so under new maps. Uh, in Pennsylvania, about every 10 years, we redraw the maps within the Commonwealth uh, based upon the most recent census. Uh, so after the 2020 census in 2021, uh, we went through redistricting here in the Commonwealth. Um, and so all of the folks who were running this time were running for the first time in a new district with a new map. Um, and this district that the Santo was currently representing was compressed to the lower part of Dolphin County. Um, I'm actually dropping in for those of you who are, you know, geeks and love data. Um, the redistricting PA website uh, in the chat, I just dropped in there. Uh, on that website, you can find links to um, different maps uh, that show the new districts. Uh, and if you want to click on those maps, you can get into some of the demographic data that was available to them at the time when they when they constitute those maps. Uh, so you can see the party split, uh, the way folks voted in the presidential prior, um, some of the, the other demographic information, um, household incomes, all that kind of stuff. Um, so you get an idea of, of what those districts look like. Um, the other um, flip seat in the Pennsylvania Senate um, was a surprise to a lot of folks in Northeast Philadelphia. Incumbent State uh, state Senator Jimmy Dillon, uh, he won a special election when the former Senator John Sabatina became a, a common police court judge in the first judicial district in Philadelphia. Uh, Jimmy Dillon won that race and has been serving Pennsylvania in the last two years uh, as the state senator from there. Um, he lost uh, to Joe Picozzi, uh, who ran one heck of a ground game. Um, he did not receive any support from the local Philadelphia Republican Committee. Um, they had, in their minds, brokered a deal uh, that they weren't going to put up anybody against Jimmy Dillon. Um, but uh, nonetheless, yeah. Mr. Picozzi decided that he was going to jump in the race and uh, ran one heck of a ground game, a whole lot of support from local folks, uh, and then was able, in a surprise upset, beat the incumbent, um, Jimmy Dillon. So those two flips essentially uh, were a, a net nothing uh, for the Senate. Uh, the Republicans will return to the Senate next year with a 28 to 22 majority. Uh, all total, there'll be four new members, two from the aforementioned flip districts, uh, and then two um that were replacing members of the same party for folks who were retiring. Uh, you know, three of the four new members, uh, also interesting to note, are familiar faces in that they're literally walking from the other side of the building across the hallway to the Senate. Uh, three of those four new members are House members today who will become senators uh, December 1 when they're unofficially sworn in uh, to the legislature so they can start receiving their paychecks prior to officially being sworn in on January 7th, I believe, the first Tuesday um, in January. Um, and with that, I will yield the floor. Thank you, Clint, appreciate the update. And if you if you pair what Clint just shared regarding the, the state Senate with what we're about to report on the PA State House, 
uh, I, spoiler alert, it's going to feel a lot like deja vu uh, as we head into the next session cycle here. Uh, despite the election coming down to a very dramatic finish, uh, at least as it played out in the media, uh, once the dust had settled, uh, things have landed in a place quite similar to where we had left off. Uh, with uh, just a few, a few, uh, a few changes in terms of uh, uh, personnel and, and member representation, but uh, the Democrats have retained the majority of the Pennsylvania House by uh, only one vote. Uh, so the House Democratic Caucus is set to return to that chamber uh, with control of the gavel, the agenda, uh, committees, etc. Uh, and in terms of uh, leadership. Uh, there really aren't too many shakeups there. Uh, there are a few that we'll talk about, but but mostly landing in a, in a similar spot to where we left off. There are more than a dozen new legislators that will be coming to town, uh, some of which PRLA uh, has already had an opportunity to engage along with Greenlee uh, in different capacities. Uh, and shortly, we'll be covering some uh, additional detail of the freshman class uh, but before that, though, uh, I'm sure you all are eager to learn more about what happened this week regarding the reorg, how the leadership elections, ha 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 how everything shaked out. And so, Madison, I'm uh, going to toss it to you. Uh, where did things land? Any surprises? Any big notes? Yeah, uh, there were some surprises, but we'll start with the least surprising uh, caucus, which was the House Democratic Caucus. Uh, essentially, everything stayed the same with the exception of WHIP. Uh, and caucus chair. So the the new whip is Mike Schlossberg. He's a legislator from Lehigh County, and this was previously held by uh, Representative Dan Miller uh, from Allegheny County. Uh, Schlossberg was in leadership previously, uh, but essentially the dominoes moved around and they played musical chairs, uh, which created a, a new opportunity for uh, a new caucus chair, Representative Rob Matsey uh, from Beaver County, who's currently the Consumer Protection Affairs Chairman, which is a, a rather large committee. Uh, so we do know for a fact that that will have a new majority chairman uh, or woman going into the 25-26 legislative session. Other than that, though, everything is largely the same on the House Democratic Caucus uh, side. So I'll just run through that. Joanna McClinton, Speaker of the House elect, uh, Leader Matt Bradford, uh, Whip Sh uh, Mike Schlossberg, Appropriations Chair Jordan Harris, Caucus Chair Rob Massey, Secretary uh, Caucus uh, Tina Davis, and then Caucus Administrator uh, Leanne Kruger from Delaware County, and Policy Chair is Ryan Bizarro. I would say the key takeaway here is that leadership is largely the same, but there is a concentration of Southeastern legislators here. With Dan Miller no longer a uh, whip, there actually is no one from Allegheny County who's represented in leadership in either the House Democratic Caucus or the House Republican Caucus, which we'll, we'll talk about now. Uh, so there were some pretty significant shakeups uh, within the House Republican Caucus. Uh, we now see Jesse Topper as the new leader for the House Republicans. He currently is the uh, House Education Minority Chair. Uh, he's from Bedford County. This role was previously held by Brian Cutler uh, from Lancaster. Uh, we now have uh, the whip uh, as Tim O'Neill. This actually was one of the only things that stayed the same uh, within that leadership caucus structure. Uh, O'Neill is from Washington County. Appropriations Chair was also a huge shakeup, uh, one that folks I don't think really saw coming. Uh, this is now being held by a gentleman named Jim Struzzi from Indiana County. This position was formerly held by Seth Grove from, from York. Uh, caucus chair, uh, although this uh, individual is not new to leadership, she's new to the role, uh, Martina White from Philadelphia. And then Clint Owlett from Tioga and Bradford counties. He is now the caucus secretary. And then the administrator is Cheryl Delosier. Uh, that actually stays the same as well. And she is from Cumberland County uh, here locally. And policy chair will now be uh, chaired by uh, Mr. David Rowe. Uh, Representative Rowe is uh, representing parts of Union, Juniata, Mifflin, and Snyder counties. Another important note here is Representative Rowe is also the co-chair of the Freedom Caucus within the House, but he has handed those reins over to his office mate, uh, Rob Ledbetter, who represents uh, the, the Bloomsburg area. Uh, so uh, Representative Rowe will not be chairing both of those at the same time. The key takeaway here with the, the House Republican Caucus is that leadership 
is very different, um, but it is more diverse uh, geographically compared to the House Democratic Caucus leadership makeup. But neither caucus uh, has an Allegheny County or Pittsburgh member serving in it, which we find really interesting. Uh, and the House Republicans are largely comprised of Central Pennsylvania and Western Pennsylvania members at this moment. Uh, and Zach, we want me to just go straight into new legislators. Thank you, Madison. Sounds good. All right. So as Zach alluded to, we have more than 12 new members uh, joining the, the General Assembly. Now, of course, some of these members, as Clint touched on, are, are new-ish, right? So these are, are folks that are walking across the hall, really. Uh, they're just taking their box of, of office goodies over to the Senate. We'll touch on those in a little bit, but I want to talk about the House first because there are, uh, you know, a dozen uh, members or maybe about 11 who are going to be new to Harrisburg entirely. Uh, so we have a handful of them. I would say about half of these members are actually former teachers or they've served on school boards in, in some capacity. But, you know, that's I found very fascinating. Um, you know, it's not uncommon that. Uh, teachers, former police officers, you know, that we have public servants who are continuing to be public servants, uh, you know, who are running for office, but uh, it was a large concentration. So just worth noting. Uh, one member that we've been able to identify so far, we know for sure has a background uh, in the hospitality and restaurant space. Her name is Brenda Pugh. She is replacing uh, Representative Coffer. She's from Luzerne County. She's the CEO of AMP Global Strategies, and she began her career at Mark II Family Restaurant in Dallas, where she says she learned the importance of hard work and listening to others. So that would be a, a great ally for us to uh, to speak with further once uh, she's sworn in. Uh, something else we wanted to, to bring to everyone's attention, and this name may be familiar, is uh, Gary Day. Uh, he's new-ish, emphasis on the ish. Uh, re former Representative Day is now going to be Representative Day again. He is replacing Ryan McKenzie, who, as you know, won his uh, election for uh, U.S. House. And he, like I said, is a former state representative and he has a, a background in, in marketing and human resources. Uh, I would say overall, there's a, a wide plethora of geographical areas that are represented here. Uh, but obviously, there wasn't a lot of turnover uh, that that occurred in the, in this election. So we have mm -hmm. um, Eric uh, Weeknet from, from Berks County. He's replacing Representative Barry Joswiak. He has a law enforcement background. Roman Kozak from Beaver County, replacing Jim Marshall. He, high school history and social studies teacher. Uh, Jeremy Schaefer, Allegheny County, replacing uh, Rob Mercury. He is a co-founder of a business in Western PA, and he wants to focus on infrastructure safety. Uh, Brian Russell from Westmoreland County, he's replacing Representative George Dunbar. He actually served as chief of staff to Representative George Dunbar and is a Irwin Borough Councilman. Uh, Josh Bashline from Clarion and Armstrong Counties is replacing Representative Donna Oberlander. She worked, or excuse me, he worked for the uh, Pennsylvania House of Representatives as a district manager for State Rep Park Wendling. Chad Reichert uh, from Franklin County is replacing Representative Paul Schemmel. He's actually a former ledge director for uh, former state Senator Rich Alloway and a staffer for Congressman John Joyce. Mark Anderson, York County, replacing Representative Don Kiefer, who's again walking across the hall to now serve in her role as, as Senator elect. Uh, and he uh, is an administrator and teacher in the Northern York County School District. We, of course, talked about our, our friend Brenda Pugh from Luzerne County, replacing Representative uh, Coffer. And we spoke about Gary Day. Uh, Scott Barger uh, from Blair and Huntington Counties is replacing Jim Gregory, and he is a public school teacher. Jamie Walsh from Luzerne County is replacing Mike Cabell, Representative Cabell, and he uh, works in the medical device industry and is a small business owner. So those that I all just walked through are the replacements for House Republican members that are that are outgoing. Now on the House Democratic side, we have John Inglis, who is from Allegheny County, representing or replacing excuse me, uh, Representative uh, Nick Piscitano, who will also be walking across the hall. And he is a high school counselor. Uh, Nikki Rivera is from Lancaster County, replacing Mike Sterla, and is a high school Spanish teacher and school board director. Nate Davidson uh, is from Dauphin and Cumberland Counties, and he is replacing uh, Representative Patty Kim, who is now Senator-elect Kim, and he is a former PA House Democratic Caucus staffer. 
Uh, Jacqueline Rusnock from Berks County is replacing Representative Mark Rossi, high school teacher, school board member. You're starting to notice the theme here between either former uh, school board members, high school teachers, and former staffers on the Hill. Uh, Sean Doherty uh, from Philadelphia replacing Representative Kevin Boyle. He is an attorney by trade. And then Joe Picozzi from Philadelphia representing or replacing Jimmy Dillon. Um, he has a background in strategic planning and he was an assistant to U.S. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy. Now, Joe Picozzi, uh, John Kiefer, Nick Pis Piscitano and Patty Kim, these are all of our, our new senator elects. Um, here in Pennsylvania. And of course, Don Kiefer, Representative Kiefer, is a former, soon to be former House member serving since 2016. Representative Piscitano, now Senator elect Piscitano, is from Allegheny County, replacing Representative, excuse me, replacing Senator Jim Brewster, former House member, background in accounting. And finally, uh, we have Senator elect Kim, first off in county, replacing uh, Senator John DeSanto, former House member, but also former news anchor, reporter, and Harrisburg City Councilwoman. So, a lot to learn about these new members that are coming in, uh, but we're excited to get to meet every single one of them. And, and hopefully, many of you can uh, meet them yourselves. Um, and I turn the floor back over to Zach. Thank you, Madison, for that, for the thorough update. And, uh, you know, uh, a few a few uh, heads up on a few resources we're going to provide to to all of you that have, have registered for this call. We know some of you are are viewing this webinar or even listening to this webinar on your on your phone or, you know, using a little screen. So we were we were hesitant to, to pack all the new legislators onto onto the little slide you might be viewing here. But what we what we have done and, and, and big thanks to uh, to the team at Greenleaf for producing this. We do have a comprehensive list of bios that we're going to be able to share uh, for all new members. And so I know I know Eric Adams from the PRLA team, uh, we plan to send that out to you along with the recording of this webinar. And then in addition to that, we'll also share uh, a comprehensive list of the new leadership uh, results uh, in both the Senate and the House. I I threw, uh, I, 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 I uh, sorry for any confusion, I threw the 2023-24 list in there, but then I've replaced it now with the 25-26 uh, list. And so you could download that right from the chat, but also uh, if you're listening on your phone, uh, we'll, we'll be sharing that uh, via email when we send out the recording of, of the webinar. So the next slide here, uh, some issues on the radar, some, some stuff, and we've already covered some of this ground, some of the items that PRLA is tracking, at least as it relates to the federal level. But of course, uh, many uh, many state issues that we'll be tracking as well. I mentioned deja vu earlier. Uh, I look around this call. I see so many of you uh, that have been uh, in the trenches with us on so many different battles uh, in Harrisburg. Uh, uh, we imagine a lot of that stuff is going to surface again uh, this next session, right? With with both uh, uh, with both chambers looking quite similar to where we last left off. Uh, we, we do we do anticipate a lot of those uh, uh, top ticket items to surface again. We're going to talk about a few specifics uh, in a moment here. And so I'll turn it over to PRLA Senior Director of Legislative Affairs, Lauren Brinjak, to, to help us cover some of the uh, the labor issues and, and other issues we're seeing on the radar. Lauren? Thanks, Zach. Uh, good morning, everyone. Yeah, Zach, I think you're right about deja vu. Uh, with the uh, State House Democrats retaining their one uh, vote majority and their leadership team uh, looking more or less the same as it was for the, the previous session, I think we are going to see a lot of the same labor and wage related issues that we saw uh, this past two year legislative session. And just as a reminder for everyone, we have two year legislative sessions in Pennsylvania. Uh, the 2025-2026 session will convene in January, and any piece of legislation that did not pass this session will need to be reintroduced and start the process all over again uh, come January. So one of, of those things that we are looking at and prepared for uh, is legislation addressing the minimum wage and the tipped wage. Many of you on this call may recall that back in 2023, a minimum wage, tipped wage increase piece of legislation passed the State House. That legislation, House Bill 1500, would have increased um, over a period of a couple of years the state minimum wage to $15 an hour. And of the biggest concern for PRLA, it would have drastically increased the tipped wage to 60% of that higher minimum wage. Uh, PRLA that has been uh, lobbying against a change to the tipped wage has been our legislative uh, priority for the last session. 
Um, although that legislation passed the House, it was never taken up by the state Senate. So that will die at the end of this year. Uh, but like I said, we do expect some type of wage bill to be reintroduced next year. And we will continue uh, talking to lawmakers and lobbying against any change to the tipped wage. Um, in addition to wage bills, we anticipate seeing a number of the other labor related issues, uh, such as a paid sick leave mandate. And that was legislation that came out of our House Labor and Industry Committee um, just a month or so ago this year. Um, legislation which would mandate uh, paid meal breaks. Legislation uh, this session would have mandated paid 30 minute meal breaks for every five hours worked. And that was another piece of legislation that came out of our House uh, Labor and Industry Committee. Uh, one other item I'd like to put on everyone's radar, legalization of recreational marijuana. That's been an issue that's happened in fits and starts in the Pennsylvania legislature over the past number of years. I think uh, this next legislative session, the House Democrats may take a real run at getting a piece of legislation out of their chamber. We've heard recent comments from House Majority Leader Matt Bradford that that is something he would like to get done in the coming session. Uh, so we may see some action on that, or at least more action than we've seen in the last couple of years on that topic. And I would jump in just to say, I mean, as it relates to, you know, traditional lodging and, and tourism, I mean, we, you know, some of the things we were in the trenches on last session, I imagine us to be in the trenches in again, uh, th this session, uh, a, a lot of uh, a lot of incumbents are are returning, and, and again with with the with with the majority control remaining the same in both chambers, we we really do anticipate a lot of that stuff surfacing in similar forms as it did last session. But uh, we're going to remain as vigilant and proactive as as we can as it relates to discussions on tourism funding. Uh, given that much has not changed in the legislature, we do anticipate. Uh, we don't anticipate much of a change as it relates to the temperature check on this particular item, uh, though you never know, right? When you get into the budget cycle uh, and when other priorities surface uh, and pop up, uh, you never know where, where this uh, where, where this lands. And so that's something we're keeping a close eye on along with our, our volunteer leaders and our policy committee and our friends at Greenlee. Uh, again, PRLA is gonna remain vigilant in ensuring that we protect the tourism funding that does exist uh, while also advocating and sharing the positive results that we're seeing uh, due to the increase and funding that was captured uh, during the last two budget cycles. It is important to note, and, and, and Madison kind of had, had noted this in a different capacity earlier, uh, uh, Representative Overlander will not be returning uh, to the PA House. And so uh, there will inevitably be a new uh, uh, R chair assigned to chair the, uh, uh, the House Tourism, Recreational and Economic Development Committee. Uh, and so that's a committee we engage with often. Uh, I, I, you never know what other changes there might be, but from, you know, from what we understand, it's, you know, Chair Daly, obviously is returning. And uh, from what we understand, I know, you know, I believe she still has interest in in serving as majority chair of that committee. Uh, and so we'll keep you all posted on that specifically. Um, and then forgive me, Lauren, I can't recall if we had mentioned this already, but it is important to note as well that there, there will be uh, inev inevitably a new chair for the Labor and Industry Committee on the R side as well, since, since Ryan McKenzie, uh, who's been a big friend to the association, um, will now be uh, the, the next congressperson for the Lehigh Valley area, having defeated Susan wild. So uh, on short-term rentals, that's an issue that's very important to much of our membership. Uh, many of you know that right now, the Joint State Government Commission is currently working on a study uh, to, to, to explore the short-term rental economy, how short-term rentals are impacting tourism, traditional lodging, and housing. Uh, this is interesting because the study is not done yet. It's going to, they, they expect it to be finalized and, and, and complete by the end of this year. But, but what's interesting about it is you have a very similar General Assembly, the same one that authorized the study in the first place returning uh, this next session, right? So when the Joint State Government Commission goes and makes policy recommendations, I imagine they come with a significant level of, of kind of credibility and authority because it was this General Assembly, essentially, uh, that authorized that study. So we'll keep everybody up posted on that. We anticipate that being released uh, sometime in December or January. Um, and uh, beyond that, I think, I don't know, Clint, Madison, if you guys have uh, anything to add on issues on the radar that we're tracking, but Feel free to jump in. Otherwise, happy to move on to our plan for success. 
Well, with that, PRLA's plan for legislative success. We can't emphasize this enough. Uh, it's so important, but 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 again, the, the both chambers look very similar uh, to to what they looked like this this last cycle, and so we're anticipating a lot of the similar issues that we've already explored with our membership and that we've already been in the trenches on to surface again. Uh, but what are we doing to make sure uh, that that we can be as successful as possible and and always fighting to ensure that you have. Uh, a seat at the table. Uh, we often say that PRLA, as it relates to advocacy, that if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. Uh, and so it's our job to make sure that our voices are heard along with our volunteer leaders, our board, our policy committees, and so many of you on this call, uh, to make sure that our legislators are, are are always familiar with the trends and challenges impacting the industry, uh, and also aware of what our priorities are, our legislative priorities, our policy priorities uh, as an industry. So uh, to kind of kick things off with, with what the landscape looks like and the cadence next year. Uh, Lauren, would you want to explore a little bit about the uh, the policy retreat and discuss the roundtables? Yeah, so we will start the year with our February policy uh, retreat in State College, and this is the meeting where the members of our three internal uh, committees that vet legislative issues will be gathering together to discuss our priorities for the upcoming legislative session. And that will include a discussion of not only the issues where we're playing defense, like with uh, the tipped wage, but also areas where PRLA can play offense. We are fortunate that we have legislative allies in all four caucuses of the state legislature, and we see a lot of opportunity to uh, start promoting pieces of legislation that benefit the hospitality industry. Um, along with that, we do regional legislator roundtables all around the state every year. We will be continuing those uh, next year as well. So make sure to look out for invitations from us. And we we hope to, uh, we normally get great turnout at these events. It's a great conversation. We have legislators from both sides of the aisle who attend our meetings and we have some pretty spirited discussions. Um, and there's also an opportunity to sort of socialize and meet and uh, chat with your your local legislator. Thanks, Lauren. And then, uh, you know, I had I had asked the I had asked some on the team, you know, if we could get like a fog machine for this this next announcement because it's just such a big deal. But I hope you'll consider saving the date. Uh, we hope you'll join us for the PRLA Public Affairs uh, Conference, our Legislative Day event on Monday, June second, and Tuesday, June third, in Harrisburg, PA. Uh, this really is a can't miss uh, event that will be an opportunity for the entire industry to unify. Uh, and to descend on the Capitol with one voice highlighting our priorities, sharing with legislators what we're seeing in terms of challenges uh, in the industry. We really hope you'll be able to join us. Uh, it's so important uh, that, we, that we show up to the Capitol in force uh, and really show the legislators up there what, what sort of army we have behind us. I can't tell you, you know, these legislator roundtables, we have one more remaining on November 21st. This is next week, next Thursday, our Brandywine Bucksmont chapter roundtable. Um, I can't tell you how often at these roundtables legislators say to Lauren and I or, or Joe, Clinton, Madison, you know, how, how many members do you represent? How many folks are engaged? How many operations? Uh, that matters. Uh, and 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 th there are a lot of you. This industry is very engaged and it's so important to the Commonwealth. Uh, and so it's, it's just as important that we show up uh, to the Capitol to advocate uh, for your concerns. And so uh, we hope you'll save the date for that June 2nd, that June 3rd event. I think uh, uh, just with 10 minutes to spare here, I think we're nearing the end of our presentation. I want to say, Eric, the next slide here is, is kind of the Q&A and, and just to thank you all for joining us.